So we'll get into um, the masterclass for today, which is just kind of about um, creating a simple website or blog. Um, yeah, either as a blog or just like a, a portfolio for kind of advertising yourself a bit. Um, and so we'll try to cover, um, you know, all the steps involved in doing that. So, you know, a bit about why you should bother, um, how you actually get your content up and available um, to the rest of the world, um, a domain name, if you want to kind of, you know, buy a domain name and, and have a unique address where your, your personal site will live. Um, and then we'll get into um, using free and open source tools to actually set up the website um, and get it running. Um, so that's the way I tend to do things if I'm creating a website. You know, it, it is possibly the the, the tinkerer's option. Um, maybe something, you know, like one of those services like Squarespace that tries to handle everything for you um, is a good option as well. Um, yeah, possibly tinkering with websites is not always the most productive thing to be doing, um, but it does give you a lot of control over um, what your website looks like. Um, yeah, so it, it's the way we tend to do it at SAH, but yeah, there are other, other valid options as well. Um, and then we'll just try to go through a, a quick rundown of, you know, what's good to have on your site, um, both from a technical perspective, you know, some of the, the technical things to tick off, um, but also just like, you know, what your content should look like, um, you know, how you create kind of good shareable links um, that you can then share on social media if you're trying to get, you know, get your research out there. Um, so we'll try to go through a bit of that as well. Um, yeah, so we won't cover um, using things like Wix or Squarespace um, that are trying to kind of like, you know, make everything um, on your site buildable with drag and drop. Um, but again, that might be a great option for you. Um, and, and some of the content we'll get to at the end, um, you know, about what content is good to have on your site will still apply. Um, one option the university does offer is they can set up a WordPress site for you. Um, but those um, require approval. So you have to kind of go through some um, approval with marketing communications um, and they have to be compliant with the university's brand and things like that. Um, so they're probably a good option. Like if your research group wants to set up like a blog to kind of share um, research for the whole group and kind of be a bit more of an official thing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not, um, really applicable if you're trying to set up a personal site for yourself. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess the basic idea of, you know, why you should have a website, um, um, I guess the main thing is kind of promoting yourself and your research, um, getting yourself out there. Um, you know, you might not be super comfortable with the idea of like advertising yourself, but it's still nice to kind of like present yourself to the world. Um, in some way. Um, and so I guess a website, um, in contrast to social media, um, you're in control of it. You kind of decide all the content on there and how everything fits together. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people have used social media to kind of get themselves out there. Um, but it just, you know, you don't necessarily control how social media works. And I think we've seen that particularly recently with you know, Twitter and X kind of going through some big changes um, and, you know, any academics that were on Twitter and kind of using that as their public presence, potentially having to rethink how they, how they deal with that. Um, so I think kind of like the, the blogging space or kind of like having these public blogs where people would discuss um, research can be like a really important way that um, research and discussions about research happen. Um, so I'm not sure if people have seen it, but there's a blog called um, Data Collada. Um, so I used to read that a lot when I was doing my undergrad in psychology. Um, and that was one of the, the kind of main sites that had a big Im impact on the initial discussions of the, the reproducibility crisis in psychology and social science and things like that. Um, so that's something that kind of had a big impact on research. 
Um, and it was coming from the, this kind of like blogging sphere rather than from, you know, necessarily people publishing in academic journals. Um, so it sort of allows discussion of research in, in different ways to what you might see in academic journals. Um, and it can be useful to have that. Um, yeah, and there's things that are like really useful, but that don't necessarily make their way into journals, just like, you know, tutorials on how to use a tool or just kind of like, you know, like a, a discussion of where you think the field is going. Um, yeah, so I think there is a lot of room for kind of blogging and a, a more informal way to talk about research. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess this this is my personal view, but, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of kind of computer generated content um, springing out of chat GPT and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, potentially that makes humans um, less important for generating content on the web. Um, but also in other ways, it kind of makes human generated content that someone actually cares about enough to write um, more important than ever. Um, yeah, so there's kind of different reasons why you might have a website like this. Um, yeah, well, your specific reasons might be different to mine, um, but I think the most important one is you should set one up if you kind of want to share your knowledge and, and help people. Um, I think that's kind of the, the what I've got out of like reading researchers' blogs over the years, um, and I think that's what seems to have the most staying power. Um, so there's communities like R bloggers. Um, if you use R for programming, um, you can learn a lot just by following that, and it kind of collects you know multiple researchers or you know researchers or programmers' blogs, and there's kind of always useful and interesting information there just from you know, multiple people participating in this community of blogging. Um, I have a personal blog. It's possibly not the um, best example of how to advertise and market yourself. Um, so I went and found someone else's that, that does do a good job of that. Um, you know, they've got their personal portfolio website. They've got, you know, like a, a short description of what they do. Um, they've got links to their public presences all over the web. Um, and they also just have like a nice design um, that's kind of accessible, readable, um, kind of gives you the idea very quickly. And then, you know, um, ways to like go and find more information if you're interested um, in finding out more. Um, one thing we do within our team is we have this, what we call a, a tech tidbits blog. Um, and that's where we just try to share little, you know, five minute, um, five minute long ideas of, you know, tools that people have found that make their lives easier, um, little tips for kind of using the university's IT system sometimes, um, or just kind of, you know, just ideas we want to share within the team. Um, so this tidbits blog is set up with the, the same kind of software we'll be talking about today. Um, and it's once you've got it set up, which is a little bit of work, um, it makes it fairly easy for different people in the team just to write a quick post um, and have it go up on a site where, where the whole team can see it and kind of, you know, check out what everyone else has been doing. Um, yeah, so getting into some of the, the process of setting up a website. Um, so one thing you need to think about um, is hosting. Um, most blogs or kind of portfolio sites like we'll be talking about today only really need static hosting. So you get the HTML files that make up the website basically and, and store them somewhere on the internet and make them available. Um, the good thing about that is there's generally a lot of free options for that. Um, and even if you did need to pay for some reason, like you got huge amounts of traffic or something, um, it, it would probably still be relatively cheap. Um, so yeah, some of the options that we tend to use um, just because we're using GitHub already to host our code and things like that, um, GitHub provides um, a fairly simple way to, you know, turn um, code that you're hosting into a website through its pages service. Um, there's a competitor GitHub called GitLab that does the same thing. 
Um, and then there's different kind of web development companies that also offer you free hosting um, for your websites. So one that I've used is Versal, um, but I'm sure there's, there's hundreds of options out there um, if you just need a way to host your files and get them out there. Um, yeah, so if you're not sure what a um, static website is, it's basically you know, a website that's mostly made up of HTML pages um, that you can just store on the server, so nothing's being dynamically generated. Um, so it's a fixed set of pages that's basically going to be the same for all users. Um, and everything on the site is going to be public. So you can't have things protected by logins or whatever. Um, you can't have like secret information. Um, nowadays, that's kind of a little bit more complicated because static pages can have JavaScript that can add all kinds of interactivity and, and data fetching and, and kind of logging into some services. Um, so it's potentially a bit more complicated than just saying a, a static website is a totally fixed set of pages. Um, yeah, basically, yeah, the basic idea is that a static website, it works well for a blog because, yeah, you don't need to be um, dynamically generating um, the pages on the fly as people log in. Um, so one thing um, you can think about if you are trying to set up a portfolio for yourself and kind of having a public presence is a domain name. Um, we'll be talking about using um, GitHub pages today. And if you're using GitHub pages, you don't need to pay for a domain name because you, you set up your site on, on GitHub and it gives you this, this default um, URL um, that you can access your blog through, um, or it's just your site.github.io. Um, but if you do want to pay for a domain name for yourself, you know, with your, your real name or something, um, they, they cost roughly $10 a year. Um, and that changes a bit depending on kind of like how marketable the domain name is, but your full name, um, if you use both your full, uh, first name and surname, um, is probably going to be something like that. And there's hundreds of these different um, top level domains now where you can have your address ending in .io or .xyz. Um, and they, they're often a bit cheaper than if you really need the, the .com address. Um, yeah, it, it, once you have bought a domain name, um, you just kind of like, you know, if you're hosting your site on GitHub pages, um, there'll be a setting within GitHub pages um, that you just kind of point your domain name to. Um, but I guess the advantage of having a, a personal domain name that you've paid for is if you move away from GitHub pages and set up your website differently, um, you can you can keep that same domain name and kind of change your website, um, but not lose that connection to public presence. Um, so the the companies you use, like the services you use to buy a domain name, are things like Namecheap, um, Cloudflare, Hover. Um, I'm not going to re recommend any in particular. I think they're all basically the same, um, you know, and I don't want to be singling out a particular commercial service. Um, they might have some slight variation on, you know, the, the price you pay to initially buy the domain and the renewal fees. Um, but from what I've seen, they're, they're mostly pretty similar. Um, so um, in terms of the, the tools we'll use to actually create the site, um, what we'll be talking about today is, is Pelican. Um, which is a tool that's that's built in Python. Um, so you may or may not have um, experience with Python. The thing about Pelican is it doesn't really use a huge amount of Python code. It's mostly about just like writing the content and, and putting it up on GitHub um, if you're hosting it via GitHub. Um, but yeah, there, there is a little bit of Python there. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about Pelican today, but there, there's a few other tools that are very similar um, that are built in R or, or something else. Um, and that they all work in basically the same way. Um, so in terms of the technical skills um, you need to create a website with Pelican, um, you basically need to get your head around Markdown, which is how you'll write most of your content. 
Um, and that's basically this, this plain text format um, that allows you to specify things like bold and italics and links um, just by like, you know, you know, putting asterisks around a word if it's in italics. You know, there's some the bracket syntax for links. Um, it's it's fairly simple, uh, but yeah, you just kind of need to get used to um, writing in that format. Um, you do probably need some basic um, terminal or command line skills because you kind of install Pelican um, via the terminal and then you run some commands to, to preview or generate your site in the terminal. Um, and then you just need to um, upload um, your site and its files to GitHub. Um, so in terms of getting started with those kind of things, um, if, if you haven't done them before, um, what we would probably recommend is using um, Visual Studio Code, um, which is a good kind of programming editor that's really good for like the plain text files you'll be writing in Markdown. Um, it can potentially help you um, get your head around the terminal because it does have a built-in terminal. Um, and then, yeah, you, you can do some um, Git or GitHub things through it. Um, but you might also want to install the, the GitHub desktop app, which tries to be kind of a, a user-friendly um, GUI for GitHub. Um, yeah, so like I said, um, yeah, it, it generally doesn't involve, you know, pro programming skills to generate these sites. Um, it's just about dealing with the kind of format of Markdown and the, and the configuration files the, the site use users. Um, but yeah, you, you might pick Pelican because you're already working in Python, or you might use Blogdown because you're already working in R. Um, but from then on, um, yeah, it, it's not necessarily um, a huge amount of programming involved. Um, yeah, so the alternative is Pelican that, that basically work the same way. Um, there's Blogdown, which runs in R. Um, there's Jekyll, which runs in Ruby. We don't tend to use Ruby a lot in um, SAH, um, but I mean, I guess the advantage for Jekyll is it is integrated with GitHub. So you will sometimes see some nice templates and things um, that you can potentially download and get started with um, that will like automatically build in GitHub. Um, and then there's things like Hugo around that, that run in Go. Um, all of them, mostly use Markdown for their content. Um, and then it's just about kind of writing some configuration files to set everything up. Um, if you do want to try Blogdown, there's a free book um, on using Blogdown um, written by the creator. Um, you know, R is often quite good for having these nice documentation pages available. Um, so it's worth checking that out if you want to try that option. Um, yeah, so rather than going through all the technical details to start with, um, I thought, you know, we'd start from the most important step, which is actually writing your content. Um, so again, this is writing content in Markdown. Um, the Markdown part kind of starts here, uh, where you can see you're mostly writing out your text, but then there's just a bit of syntax um, to link to other pages or um, you know, add an image or, or add a header or something like that. Um, so you, yeah, you can include images, code samples, links to your other posts or to other websites. Um, but you write a post like this in, in Markdown um, and then you use the, the site generator using like Pelican um, to apply a nice theme or template to it. Um, you know, li link the post up to all the lists and categories of posts you have um, and link it up to other pages within the site. Um, so once your, your blog or your site is set up, um, that's how you'll be adding new pages to it. Um, yeah, writing these little markdown files with a bit of metadata and then the content you want to put on it, um, and then just running um, Pelican or whatever site generator you're using um, to update the site and then kind of upload it and then put it on the web. Um, yeah, so going back to step one, um, the full process involves installing Pelican. Um, 
you know, it's a Python tool, so you use um, generally use pip to install that, the Python um, package manager. Um, when you're starting out with your site, um, you need to find a, a theme or a template. Um, so there is a big list of them at um, pelicanthemes.com. Um, you'll find that some of them are not particularly well maintained, um, but yeah, there, there usually are a few popular ones that are fairly well maintained and easy to use. Um, yeah, for a portfolio where you're kind of trying to advertise yourself, um, one of the common designs you'll see is kind of having this, this sidebar uh, where you've got kind of like, you know, potentially a picture and, and your name and then a short bio for yourself and social links to kind of link to your public presence. Um, so a thing like this Pelican Hide theme could be a good place to start. Um, yeah, and when you're looking at themes, you do also want to look um, to check whether the theme says it's mobile friendly or responsive. Um, just because a lot of people do use um, mobiles to, to browse the web these days. Um, so you do want to do a basic check that the site looks okay on a mobile. Um, once you've got Pelican installed, um, again, in your terminal, um, you'll just be running the Pelican quick start command, which kind of sets up the basic structure of the site. Um, you'll be going through and doing some configuration, which we'll get into. Um, creating some content um, and then kind of deciding when you're you're ready to launch the site basically. Um, while you're doing that, um, Pelican has a tool to kind of you know preview the site in your local browser um, before you upload it. So it's got this command um, Pelican kind of listen for changes and automatically reload. Um, and then it'll kind of in the terminal it'll show your site's now running at this address um, and you can you can try it out as you're making changes to it. Um, yeah, so what you do in the configuration is basically set up important things like your name, um, the name of the site, um, you know, the things like your GitHub URL if you're linking out to your GitHub. Um, and generally, the, the theme you're using in Pelican um, will automatically insert those into the right places. Um, so you're not doing too much, um, you know, you're not having to go into the actual HTML pages and edit all that in all the various places it's used. Um, the theme should be set up to use these in bits of information where they're needed. Um, so in Pelican, um, the configuration file is a Python script. Um, called pelican.conf, um, but it's basically just a list of settings like this. Um, you're not generally doing um, complex, complex coding. Um, so you have your pelican conf file. Um, in Pelican, you also have um, a publish.conf file, which has um, settings specific to the final public ver published version, um, but that just kind of adds on to the pelican conf file. Um, yeah, depending on the theme you're using in Pelican, there might be some extra options um, that might make it easy to set up things like Google Analytics. Um, so it's worth reading the documentation for your theme um, and seeing if you can turn on things like that. Um, but you're basically going through and just making sure things like the author and the site name um, are set, um, and then you should be good to go. Um, yeah, so um, when you go to publish, again, you're just running a, a Pelican command in your terminal. Um, so you're going Pelican and pointing it at your publication specific settings. Um, and Pelican will basically spit out a bunch of HTML files, um, usually in a folder like build or public. Um, and it's that folder that basically contains all the most important files that you're going to upload to GitHub and publish on the web. Um, so once you've done that, um, you commit those changes to Git. Um, so basically, you know, add this build or public folder to Git and upload it to GitHub. Um, and then you point um, GitHub or whatever hosting tool you're using at that folder. Um, so GitHub does make that relatively straightforward. Um, 
in its GitHub pages settings. Um, but yeah, there, there's a few different ways to set it up. So the best option is just to go through the, the GitHub pages documentation, just to make sure you're, you're getting everything set up the way you want it to. Um, yeah, and then basically at that point, you're done, hopefully. So yeah, so if you're using GitHub pages, um, GitHub will automatically set up your site at a .github.io URL. Um, and from that on, point on, your, your site is accessible um, to anyone on the internet. Um, yeah, so just to give a little bit of an overview of uploading to GitHub, if you, if you haven't dealt with Git before, um, it can be a bit tricky to get your head around at first. Um, but again, I'd recommend trying um, GitHub Desktop, um, which kind of gives you a nice interface for, for managing um, the uploads. Um, so one important thing to mention is that, um, you know, in the folder where you're keeping all the files for your site, um, you should treat everything um, in there as public. Um, so there are ways to keep private information out of Git, um, but particularly for a, a blog site um, where it's basically a static web page, you know, everything on your web page is going to be publicly accessible uh, and you should probably think of everything in, in your folder as publicly accessible as well. Um, yeah, so just be wary of that when, you, when you're checking things into Git and uploading it. Um, but basically, um, you know, you're writing new posts, you're rebuilding the site to create that build or public or docs folder. Um, and then you're just adding all those changes into Git and uploading it to GitHub. Um, and if you are setting up a personal blog, um, it's probably best to use the public github.com. Um, if you're not aware, um, the University of Sydney also has its own internal GitHub um, for kind of your research work. Um, but it's potentially a bit trickier to, to make the sites there um, available to the public. Um, yeah, so just use github.com for, for creating a publicly accessible site. Okay, um, so like I mentioned, um, yeah, I tried to keep the, the technical details of, of using these um, site generator tools um, fairly brief and just kind of give you an overview of the steps involved. Um, but yeah, feel, feel free to ask questions if you have them at the end. Uh, we will try to help people with that. Um, but yeah, what I wanted to get onto now is kind of, you know, what makes for good content on a website? Um, so the first thing I'd say is, you know, I, I was, I was and still am, I guess, in the, the academic world. And I know what academic writing looks like, and it's not good writing for the web. So when you're writing for the web, um, try to make sure you know you're writing short paragraphs using active voice. Um, academics are particularly bad at using passive voice for everything. Um, do things like you know providing links to more detail rather than you know trying to explain all the detail um, on your page. Um, and use you know a bit of formatting to emphasize things and kind of break up your paragraphs. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of makes for more readable content. Um, you know, one thing that's always tricky with blogs is, is they do work best and they kind of bring people back if you publish regularly. Um, so try to think and kind of plan out content in advance so you can kind of keep putting things up there. Um, but it is hard and it's kind of like a perennial thing that people set up their blogs and then, um, you know, publish very sporadically on it. That's okay as well. Um, but yeah, potentially not the best if you kind of kind of trying to advertise yourself and use your blog to kind of get your name out there. Um, yeah, and the other thing I would say is, you know, try to write the content that you would want to read. Like, try not to make it too, you know, marketing friendly or, you know, doing things that, you know, SEO optimizers tell you to do. Um, write tutorials about things you figured out how to do. You know, write your well thought out opinions on things you're thinking about, you know, write fun posts on fun ideas you've had. Um, yeah, and, and I think 
you know, if you're writing content that you would want to read, um, other people would want to read it as well. Um, yeah, in terms of advertising yourself, um, yeah, I guess the number one thing to do is just make sure that on your site, you know, front and center, um, you do have um, links to your presence elsewhere. Um, so that can be social media. Um, for your research, it can also be good to, you know, link to your ORCID or Google Scholar if you want people to see all your research work. Um, if you're kind of doing programming or data analysis and your work consists of, you know, projects and, and packages you published, um, link to your GitHub. Um, yeah, and then think about rather than, you know, just having a series of blog posts, you can also set up dedicated pages um, where you list the, the publications you put out or, or the talks you've done. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, Gordon MacDonald, uh, informatics team lead here at SIH, um, who set up his personal blog fairly nicely with, you know, a quick bio of who he is and then links to his presences all over the internet. Um, and that's basically all you need to get started with, you know, putting yourself up on a website and, you know, when people visit the website, they know who you are and they, they can find out more if they want to. Um, in terms of some of the more the technical things for um, making sure your content is kind of searchable and is kind of going to show up in Google search results, um, there are a few um, tools you can use to, to check on your site um, that will give you useful advice about things that, you know, might cause your site to be um, kind of devalued in search results. Um, so Google um, gives more weight to pages that load quickly, um, and they have this page speed checker um, that you can feed your site into. Um, and yeah, so sometimes it's a bit hard to know how to fix things um, if you don't know that much about web design. Um, but sometimes it can, can just tell you useful things like you've got this one huge image in here that's taking forever to load um, and it's really slowing your page down. So it is worth checking even if you're not confident about, you know, being able to make changes to the, the site design. Um, another thing that's good to check is um, accessibility. Um, you know, so some people might be reading your site with a, with a screen reader or something. Um, so things like adding alt text to your images. So, um, you know, people who are visually impaired can still get an idea of what the image is, um, can be really useful. Um, so there's an automated checking tool for things like that. And if you are going to, um, you know, share your posts on social media, um, the way they show up um, as previews on social media um, typically happens through this kind of open graph protocol. Um, and at this site here, opengraph.xyz, um, you can feed your, your entire site or individual pages um, into their checker and it'll show you how that um, preview is going to show up um, for sites that are using this, this open graph data to preview things. Um, so you can see if you feed in the university's homepage, um, it has a page title, it has a short description, and it has a preview image. Um, again, if you don't know that much about um, web design and HTML, um, that might be slightly tricky to fix, um, but that there are also um, you know, some good guides out there about how to get that going. Um, personally, I would say not to stress too much about, you know, SEO, search engine optimization, and kind of doing all the things marketers do to make sure their, their sites show up at the top of results. Um, it's a big confusing world of, um, you know, tips and tricks for things that Google algorithm potentially likes. Um, but I think for kind of a research portfolio, um, those things don't matter as much as just kind of like, you know, writing interesting content, um, getting it shared and used by other researchers potentially, um, and just having kind of that your content get out there a bit more organically. Um, and as part of that, 
you know, you know, if you're reading other people's sites and blogs and you're, you're seeing useful information there, um, just make sure you're link, linking to them um, and kind of sharing what you've seen there. Um, because, you know, part of what drives Google search results is just kind of people using um, linking to pages that they genuinely find useful. Um, and that's still a good way to go about it. Um, yeah, so if you do want to get more into the, the nitty gritty of site design and kind of tweak how your sites work, um, with Pelican, um, there's a bunch of Pelican plugins available that can add extra little features to your site. Um, so you can do things like set up a search, um, search functionality for your site. Um, you can have those little things where next to your articles, you say, you know, this, this page has a five minute estimated reading time. Um, those do require a bit of extra setup, um, but they also, you know, integrate fairly smoothly with Pelican. Um, so they can be quite quick to set up. Um, yeah, if you're kind of um, very picky about your aesthetics and you want to tweak the template or theme you're using or even create your own, um, usually what's involved in that is knowledge of HTML and CSS. Um, so yeah, again, that's, that's a big topic to tackle. Um, if you are kind of starting from scratch and trying to figure out how it works in the world of modern web design and trying to make things responsive, um, there's CSS frameworks like Bootstrap and Tailwind that, that do some of the work there for you. Um, but yeah, even as a, a bit of a tinkerer and a tweaker myself who has made my own custom theme for a blog, um, it probably wasn't the most productive way to spend my time. And, you know, if you, I wanted to like, you know, has it have a successful blog that kind of got out there and got shared, um, my time probably would have been better spent writing new content that people found interesting. Um, yeah, so it is a little bit hard to pick a theme you like and that kind of works well. Um, I've tried to give a quick list of them here just so you have somewhere to start. Um, but again, it's going to come down a bit to your personal preference um, of what you like in um, website design. Um, yeah, but just starting off here so you know that there's some decent ones that are kind of up to date and working well. Um, yeah, and that is basically it for the content I had for today. Um, so yeah, we've got all our links to our presences in different places. Um, I think after this talk today, we'll try to upload it to YouTube and we're trying to, doing, trying to do that with our masterclasses particularly, but also some of our other training courses. Um, so it's worth checking that out. Um, and one thing we do try to do with uh, training courses um, is just get feedback um, on what is and isn't working. Um, I think we will send out an email with a link to this training survey um, if you're not getting it via the QR code now, uh, but we just wanted to make it um, front and center um, so people could fill it, fill it out on the spot um, while they had it fresh in their mind. Um, yeah, so we'll be sending out an email with um, a link for um, feedback um, we'll also send out the slides because there were a few um, useful links through here. Um, happy for you to share the slides with anyone. Um, yeah, and like I said, yeah, we, we will be aiming to put this up on YouTube shortly. Um, yeah, but now, so we have left some time for questions. I don't think I've seen any in the chat so far, um, but yeah, feel free to ask any um, if you have them. Um, Okay, so David's asked, what do you see as the advantages of a blog compared to a ResearchGate profile? Um, I haven't used ResearchGate um, personally. Um, so I know it's good for kind of like um, putting your actual journal articles um, out there and kind of making them a bit more shareable potentially. And there is some scope for discussion. Um, you know, with people making comments and things. Um, I think all those things are great. Um, so yeah, if you do have a ResearchGate profile and that is working for you, 
um, yeah, I think that is a good option. Um, you know, as a data scientist and programmer, um, I'm often interested in things like tutorials and kind of like fun little demos and things. Um, and those tend to work well on a blog. Um, yeah, but again, like I think ResearchGate is, you know, a, a social media service basically. And yeah, potentially you're not totally in control of, you know, what decisions they make about, you know, how they um, make your content accessible and they could go through changes. Um, so it is kind of nice to have this, this one um, presence on the internet that you sort of control completely yourself. Um, yeah, and, and once you have them, the blog set up, um, you know, like we did with our team tidbits blog, um, it does potentially become um, something that multiple people can contribute to fairly easily, um, which I guess is maybe a little bit harder with um, a research gate profile. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess to some degree it comes down to personal preferences and what you're aiming to do. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, so it doesn't look like people have any particular questions. Um, so like I said, yeah, um, you know, check out our other training courses. Um, feel free to come along to Hacky Hour next month. Um, so September 20th, I think, um, you know, for help with, you know, potentially web, web getting a website set up, um, you know, potentially any coding or data questions you have, um, and we'll try to help you out. Um, but otherwise, thanks for coming along today.